Hello folks, welcome to the second video of class 8. Uh, in that first video we talked about uh, solar heating as a function of latitude and how that affects how much solar electricity you might make at different places on Earth. In this video we want to go one step further and basically think about how clouds are generated and how that might influence our ability to make solar electricity also. And we're going to look at this through the lens of how air pressure arises and how that drives atmospheric circulation, which generates clouds. So obviously, this is important in terms of thinking about solar energy, solar electricity. But also, it's important um, in general, because differences in solar heating uh, and air pressure cause wind. And wind is an important part of the climate system overall. So I'll motivate this problem by comparing two maps. We've seen this one already. It's insulation at the top of the atmosphere. We saw it's higher at the equator, of course, and much lower at the poles. But look at this one. This one's annual insulation at the surface. And notice how much less consistent it is. It's not symmetrical. We see some areas that have very high insulation in red. But then mixed in with them are some areas of, of much lower insulation in white. And in particular, the equator itself actually isn't necessarily uh, the highest belt of insulation at the surface. So what's going on? Why do we have this different insulation at the surface than at the atmosphere top? And the reason, of course, is because of clouds. And so we're going to talk about that today. So the outline for this uh, lecture is we'll first introduce the idea of air pressure. Then we'll talk about how air pressure drives atmospheric circulation. Then we'll talk about how clouds form. And then we'll kind of combine that and look at how circulation plus cloud formation ultimately governs the amount of local solar insulation that you're likely to get. So let's start with air pressure. Um, air pressure is literally the weight of overlying molecules of air. So when you're standing on the ground, there's something above you, and it's a column of air that actually has molecules in it. For example, carbon dioxide and water. Of course, gravity's acting on those molecules, and it's pulling them down on top of you. And so the weight of that column of air, or the air pressure, uh, deter is uh, a function of how densely packed the molecules are and also how much those molecules weigh. So for example, if you considered an equal volume of air that had the same number of atoms or molecules in it, uh, but the, the volume that has helium atoms, which weigh much less, would actually weigh a lot less than the volume of air that has the heavier carbon dioxide atoms in it. So the point is, if you have heavier atoms or molecules, or you pack them in tighter to the same volume, that, that volume is going to weigh more, and the air pressure under it is going to be higher. Now it turns out that, of course, air is mostly made of the same composition throughout. So it's not composition that really affects the density of air. It's really actually temperature. As air gets warmer, the molecules naturally drift further apart, and the air becomes less dense. Okay, It weighs less, and that means that it's lower pressure. It tends to rise because it, it's less dense. In contrast, cool air uh, tends to contract. It allows molecules to be closer together, which makes cold air more dense. Therefore, it weighs more and ends up being high pressure. If you're standing under a column of cold air, you feel more pressure. So in general, cold air weighs more and it sinks. Okay, So basically, warm air rises, cold air sinks. So an example of uh, changes in air pressure is in this figure. Um, this is time along the x-axis and air pressure along the y-axis. And you can see that at night, when it's cold, the air pressure 
is high, then during the day when it warms, the air pressure gets much lower. So these are daily cycles of air pressure changing up and down as the surface of the Earth warms and the air next to it also gets warmer. So air pressure generates wind. And the way this works is that uh, air is, of course, a liquid, or it's, it's a gas, <laughs> but it can behave like a liquid and flow. And what that means is that if you're sitting under a column of cold, high pressure air, you're basically being squeezed like toothpaste out of a tube. And you want to escape out from under that cold air and head towards areas of lower pressure, warm air. And so the pressure is always trying to re-equilibrate or balance out on the surface of the Earth, which means that air is always trying to flow out from under high pressure, cold air, towards lower pressure, warm air. But why are there air pressure differences in the first place? Well, this brings us back to solar insulation. Remember that we get much higher solar insulation at the equator. So that means the land surface is warming up a lot more here on an average day than it is in the Arctic, okay? because of that higher insulation. So we get warmer ground surface temperatures. That warms the air, makes them into low pressure air masses. And of course, they start to rise, OK? And as those low pressure air masses start to rise, they inevitably expand and cool, OK? And as they cool, they end up shifting off towards the north, and they eventually start to sink back down towards the surface around 30 degree latitude, OK? So if you think about what's happening on the surface, basically you've got low pressure air lifting off here, and then you've got cold high pressure air sinking back down. So what happens then, of course, if you're air on the surface, you're going to flow away from the sinking high pressure and flow along the surface towards that uh, rising warm low pressure air. OK, you're going to flow down the pressure gradient here. And this whole cycle is actually called a Hadley cell. It's, a, it's an atmospheric circulation cell. So it's a pattern of air movement that's driven by the focused solar heating at the equator. Now there's an additional factor here, which is that the Earth is spinning. And that gives rise to something called the Coriolis force, or the Coriolis effect. We're not going to get into that except to say that the Coriolis effect deflects surface winds. So they're trying to flow to the south, and they end up getting deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. And they get deflected by the spinning Earth, and they end up becoming what are called trade winds, kind of flowing off to the southwest. But now you'll see there's another complementary atmospheric circulation cell up here at the mid-latitudes. Okay, And in this case, again, cold air is sinking at 30 degrees. But in this case, it's flowing back north. Okay, And uh, that air also gets deflected to the right. And those will become the westerly surface winds. And of course, the westerlies are what we're familiar with in the United States. If you're in the western United States, you often, most days, the air is going to be flowing off the ocean from the west as part of this westerly circulation pattern. OK, so that pretty much sums up the simple version of how differences in solar heating can give rise to large-scale atmospheric circulation. But let's talk about cloudiness again. Take a look right here. You see this band of clouds over the equator. That's what we were interested in as far as suppressing the surface insulation in our, our solar electricity generation. So why are those clouds forming preferentially at the equator? Well, it has to do with these rising air masses. As the, air, as the warm air rises and cools, 
we actually condense clouds right there at the equator. So again, these clouds are actually driven by the focused solar heating. Let's see how that works. So the way this works is that um, as cold air, uh, excuse me, as warm air rises and cools, it actually can hold less water vapor. And that's a relationship known as the clausius clapeyron equation. And it's charted out here. This blue line is the saturation water vapor pressure. So this is the water vapor pressure at which uh, water must condense from a gas into a liquid. And so as temperature, uh, well, let's go in, as temperature goes from warm to cold, the saturation water vapor pressure drops from around 40 millibars down to 20, down to 10, 5, and so on. So this graph literally shows that as temperature drops, the amount of water that air can hold also drops. So what does that mean at the equator? It means that as warm, wet air rises, it's warm and it's holding a lot of water, okay? Because it, it was warm, so it's, it was able to hold a lot. But as it cools, uh, it can hold less and less. And eventually, we have to condense that out. So as it cools, we exceed the, the saturation vapor pressure, and that water starts to condense. Condensing water, uh, of course, makes clouds. OK, so let's summarize that one more time. Um, at the equator, we get a lot of heating. We get hot air masses that are rising and cooling and condensing out clouds. But, and so that explains why we see, in general, a little bit less uh, solar insulation at the surface at the equator, some white bands, because clouds are blocking it out. But if we go just north of there, for example, to the Sahara Desert in North Africa, or to the Sonoran Desert in northern Mexico and Arizona, we see really high solar insulation. And that's because there's no clouds in these areas. And the reason there's no clouds is because these are areas where the air masses are downwelling. The cold air is sinking down and warming. And of course, as cold air warms, it can hold more water vapor. And so we literally have no clouds. It's the opposite of condensation. Uh, you're not even close to saturating uh, the amount of water that air can hold. So as that water sinks, we end up with deserts in these regions. And that really increases the annual solar insulation because we don't have clouds in those regions. So what does this mean for solar energy across uh, the United States and Vermont in particular? Well, obvious, so this, this plot shows the uh, kilowatt hours per meter squared per day that you could make with a solar tracker. So it's literally an estimate of if you owned a solar tracker, how much electricity could you make? Obviously, you're going to be best off in Arizona and Southern California, where it's sunny all the time. Why is it sunny all the time out here? Well, it's because this is an area where we get some of that uh, cold air downwelling and warming up, and we have no clouds. Now, if we compare that to the Northeast, say Vermont or New York, this is some of the worst uh, solar electrical generation potential in the United States. It's pretty much just as bad as Seattle. Basically, it's cloudy and rainy in the Northeast pretty often. And the reason for that actually has to do with some fairly complex uh, airflow. It's not just quite as simple as the atmospheric circulation that we described before. In the Northeast, we're basically an area where three different air flows are constantly battling. We get the westerlies coming from the west that we already talked about. We also get some warm tropical air coming up out of the Gulf of Mexico. And then we get blasts of really high pressure, cold Arctic air coming down from Canada.
And so these air masses are competing with each other right over the northeastern US here. And what that means is there's constantly a lot of fronts moving through this area in places where cold air is meeting hot air. And so what happens when cold air meets hot air? Well, the colder, denser, high pressure air slides in under the warmer air, which is then forced up and over. And as that warm air rises, it cools. And of course, we condense clouds. So anytime you have kind of air masses colliding, you'll often generate clouds because one is forced up and over the other. And that's really what happens in Vermont. And that's why Vermont isn't that great for solar electrical generation potential. OK, so in summary, here's what we've learned. Uh, air pressure is the weight of overlying air. So warm air tends to weigh less and be low pressure. Cold air tends to weigh more and be high pressure. Uh, wind is surface air that's flowing out from under high pressure towards low pressure. Uh, if we think about the equator, focused solar heating at the equator warms the air, creates low pressure that rises. That air then cools and creates a lot of clouds that block the sunlight. The opposite happens near 25 degree latitude where that air has now cooled and is sinking. And as it warms up, uh, we get a cloud-free sky. And then we finish by looking at how the northeastern US is generally bad for solar energy, uh, because we have a lot of competing air masses and fronts where warm air is forced up over cold air, starts to cool, and we get clouds. So I'll leave you with these concept questions. Uh, please follow this link to take the quiz. And we'll see you next week for class nine, where we'll start talking about wind and wind energy.